Hello, everybody, and hello to those who are watching this live, as well as those who are watching it back via the recording. It's fantastic to have everybody here with us currently and in the future when people are watching these recordings. Welcome back to the final, the fourth and final webinar of the DevOps short course uh, presented by the wonderful Brenton Birchmore. Topic four is this week learning. So carrying some of the knowledge that we have gained from the past three weeks and uh, applying it a little bit further. Very excited to see what kind of learnings Brenton has for us. Feel free to drop in the chat if you're watching live, uh, if you've been engaging on the forums. If you are not aware, the forums are where you can find all of the recordings from the previous webinars, the prior three weeks of webinars, as well as, uh, sorry, the, the learn.itmasters.edu.au is where you can find the recordings from the prior three weeks, as well as recorded pre-records from Brenton on other topics and different little informative tidbits, some readings and all the course materials that are necessary. It's also where you can take the exam, which will be available to you shortly after the conclusion of the short course. Kit will drop in some information for us about that fairly soon. Speaking of Kit, just like to say, as we get started, thank you very, very much to our wonderful presenter, Brenton, as well as Kit, who has been doing the uh, back end, behind the scenes, technical support and logistics, etc., for us, as well as running a lot of the activity on learn.itmasters.edu.au. My name is Jack. I am a course consultant and eligibility assessment officer with IT Masters. Uh, and we're about to get properly started. Before we officially start, uh, I would like to say that IT Masters is located on and we're broadcasting today from the uh, lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation uh, and pay respects to their elders and ancestors, acknowledging their ongoing sovereignty and continued connection to lands, waters and culture. So without further ado, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, I'd like to welcome Brenton Birchmore. Brenton, how have you been in the last week or the prior three weeks? Hello, Jack. Hello, Kit. Hello, everyone. Uh, I've had a good week, actually. Great to hear. A, yeah, it would have been a great week, but I pulled a muscle in my shoulder earlier in the week, and uh, that taught us that that's still bothering me a little bit. So I'm still struggling with that. But otherwise, it's been a good week. Oh no! How did you How did you pull the muscle? May I ask? Uh, uh, well, it wasn't a sporting event or anything quite so exciting. It, it was a over vigorous morning stretch. Would you believe? I could believe that. Personally, I, I get injured these yes. days from just sort of sleeping wrong. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know if I slept poorly, but when I woke up, I was a little bit too overzealous with stretching to get up. So that, that resulted in a bit of a twinge. And uh, from that point on, it's got to take a little while to get better, but it'll be fine. But uh, no, my, my week's been good. I've had, uh, I've had a bit of a revelation from my dog, actually. You know what I think? I think my dog has come to know that when I'm on a Zoom call, she won't get roused on because I'm fairly sure the frequency of her ferreting around things around my office behind me is significantly higher when I'm on a Zoom call. I mean, she's only a pup. She's 18 months old and she tends to get into things. But uh, for some reason, more and more when I happen to be on a Zoom call, I don't know if she's that clever. Maybe she is. That is... Uh... Well, Brenton, I think that now that you've mentioned having a puppy, I am crossing my fingers that there might be a slide that features said puppy at some point. <laughs> Feel free to uh, to upload any images of your puppy. Oh, maybe we can put one on the portal. We can put one on the portal, perhaps. Possibly. For anyone who anyone who, she's a little uh, cavapoo, and she's gorgeous, uh, as all little puppies are. But uh, yeah beautiful that's amazing i was saying just earlier that it's a miracle that no cats in my house have walked across my keyboard and unmuted me during this short course so hopefully nobody's pets are too much of a menace during their important zoom calls but 
on that note, hopefully nobody will be a menace. And shall we get started with some content? Will do. Hello, everyone. Good oh, evening. there you Good are. Good afternoon. Yes, I'm here. Really am here, not just a disembodied voice. Uh, we have some exciting things to go into tonight because we're going to try to tie a bow around some of the things we've already talked about. As you already intimated, uh, Jack, we're going to try and draw a line under things and uh, throw in a few other cliches along the way. What I promised last week when I spoke at length about uh, the developer's perspective, I told you that this week we tackle, tackle things more from the operations perspective, and that's what we're going to do. So we're going to look at some of the things that are more specifically relevant to that side of the equation. And learning doesn't just rest with them, but the kind of learning we are talking about is very specific DevOps kind of learning. And that's what I want to break down and go through with you. Now, before we get into that, I just want to remind everyone that the content that we're working from for the exam does include the pre-recorded audio that's been uploaded. So from that point of view, when you're looking at the exam and you're looking for answers to the questions, it's not just in the webinars. Although we cover a lot of good stuff here and we do repeat a lot of things, uh, I want to make sure everyone is aware that if you want to get all of it, you do need to have a listen to those recorded audio files. And they're only a few minutes each. They may be seven, eight minutes each sort of thing. So there'll be more information there. Now, uh, I just want to double check. I've had, I've noticed a couple of comments along the way about volume. Uh, Jack, are you hearing me well enough at the moment or do I have an audio problem I need to address? I can hear you absolutely fine. I believe Same some of usual? the comments about audio were about my audio and others in the chat did okay. mention to somebody who was uh, bringing that up that it may have been an issue on Logan. their end. Okay, I've uh, moved my microphone a little bit closer, so that'll be great. Thanks for that. Thank you. So here's where we've been going. This is our core syllabus. This is what we're up to. We're talking about some of the specific ways in which DevOps deals with and asks us to learn. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, strap yourselves in because there's going to be some things in there that might seem a little bit scary but we're going to explain it and we're going to make it all cozy and fun and interesting but there's going to be some stuff in there that might be a little bit different to what other organizations tend to do contents today what we're going to talk about is begin a little bit of an introduction and a contextual perspective of what the uh, the operations approach is meant to be all about. We're going to cover that as a background. We will talk a bit about the culture needed in an operations environment, having a just and trusting environment. We'll talk more about what that means and how to bring that about. We're going to talk about learning as a task, and that really means proactive. It means deliberate. It means scheduled. It means making learning almost a KPI. And what does that look like in the operations environment? We'll then have a little bit of talk about this very exciting and in some ways scary phenomenon that DevOps loves, which is deliberate failure, which is really something that we do need to explain in enough detail because it might not be what you assume it is if you haven't experienced it before. So that'll be interesting, I hope. Then we'll talk a little bit about lesson sharing and how that all ties together and the importance in DevOps to making sure that the lessons we learn are lessons that everyone gets a chance to learn. Thank so you so much, Brendan. Slide. Oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, feel free to finish this uh, sl this slide. I, I was fantastic. I was going to say for some learning as a task for myself, I have realized that I distracted myself somewhat when discussing your dog. And I forgot to mention to people uh, just a tiny little bit of housekeeping. If you've got questions for Brenton that are specifically about the content of the lesson, please put those in the Q&A section so that we can answer them in due course. And if you have questions or comments about uh, the logistics or the structure of the course in terms of the way that it is administered, comments on things, uh, or any comments that you would like to make for discussion with your fellow participants, please pop those in the chat section so that we can keep things nice and uh, easy, nice and streamlined for everyone. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you for that, Jack. Uh, so let's get into the opening statements. Operations. So we've given some love to the developers and we've learned a bit about what they do last week. Operations is 
tasked with making sure that we have the ideal operating environment. They are there to help make sure that whatever is needed for the ongoing continued success of that value delivery is present and any anomalies are found, any potential problems and threats can be found, are identified, are flagged, are investigated, acted upon, and that a response strategy or a million response strategies have been devised, are constantly evolving, and are always maturing to make sure that whenever anything actually happens that might threaten the continued delivery of value, that operations knows exactly what to do about it. And their main task is twofold. One, always be ready, able to respond to everything that happens and constantly be improving how they're going to respond next time. Now, that sounds a little obvious, maybe, perhaps. You might be thinking, well, okay, that sounds straightforward. But what are the areas of responsibility, or what are some of them, at least? This isn't necessarily an exhaustive list. But some of the areas that tend to fall under operations include things like underlying infrastructure, the actual equipment or the services or the cloud hosting or whatever is physically or virtually underneath that everything actually runs on. Then there's the architectural components, which are often under the responsibility of operations to make sure that things interact, the synergies, the interactions, the flow between things, whether it be bandwidth, whether it be relationships, everything that comes together typically is going to fall under an operational mindset. Then there's the assets that we need, the tools that we need. Uh, developers might come and go based on the needs of the design demand at the time, but operations needs to make sure that they always have enough of the skills, the manpower, the resources, uh, the tools necessary, whatever it is that we need to have available to us to continually do the job. In addition, operations needs to have responses. They need to have an answer. They need to have a, a solution. They need to have something to do in the moment of any incident. And as we've already talked about, a lot of that might involve working with developers if we're talking about something that's gone live with a recent deployment. There is a lot of synergy and relationship and interaction that occurs then. But not everything that happens or that goes wrong is a direct result of a deployment. And all those other things, operations needs to have something to do to help improve it, to help solve it, or to help ease the pain. And that needs to constantly evolve. And this is perhaps the hardest, perhaps the highest ideal, perhaps the most difficult, the most interesting, and the most different aspect of the way DevOps might do this compared to some other more traditional methods. Now, I want to ask everyone this question. And uh, Jack, I'm, I'm hoping you're able to put this poll up for us to ask this question. This is contextual. So this is a question that asking each of you in, in your environment that you're familiar with in your organization. When you think of operations, what does your management or leadership have as the primary expectation of your operations department such as it is? What does everyone think of that? I suppose we will find out what everybody thinks of that in the next yeah. minute or two. Really quickly, for my own indulgence, would you mind letting us know what SLA stands for? Service level agreement. Fantastic. It's Thank you. The contractual relationship between the provider and the customer, where usually the commitment is made so explicit that if it's not met and it's measurably uh, not met, then some sort of compensation might be in order. So rebates or something goes back to the customer if the parameters and conditions of the service level agreement aren't met. So they're often quite important agreements in place that have financial impact. Great, thank you. And really quickly, while people are continuing to do this poll for another minute or so, uh, we've got a question in the Q&A. Sir has asked, what is the difference between SLA and OLA? Operational level agreement is the OLA. So most of the time, 
it's contextual, the difference. You might have an operational level agreement that is a broader, bigger agreement that might encompass other things. It might talk about the nature of the relationship between organizations. It might talk about other aspects of the business uh, availability or access or servicing. Usually, a service level agreement can be something that's a little bit more specific, and it'll include details that might be unique to particular services or kinds of services. Details of service delivery that are really only well relevant for one service that would not make any sense to have them for every service. So you have an opportunity to have a, an operational level agreement that might have broad overarching agreements and commitments, whereas service level agreements might say, well, this particular service is measured in this way, and that's what that agreement's going to cover. Great. Thank you so much. Fantastic answer. Someone in the chat has said that they use OLAs between divisions and SLAs with the client, which might be a good uh, contextualizer, uh, contextualization for that. We've got a lot of people that have participated. I might go ahead and end this poll now. Uh, if you want to use the next five seconds or so, if they have not yet selected an answer, it's not compulsory. So the results of this, interesting. So we've got uh, two results that are predominant. So 27% is the highest uh, number saying that of these options, which are considered the most vital expectation or demand of operations in your organization according to its leadership, 27% have said certainty, making sure the lights are green and SLAs are maintained no matter what. Then 23% has said everything. Uh, there is no one thing that applies here. It's too complicated or too entwined. Next highest result is 18% have said adapting. Constantly improving what they do by predicting, learning, and adapting. 13% have said value, making sure that value is delivered, even when that means bending things or taking risks. Then 11% reacting. This answer changes too often or too easily, depending on the winds and whims. And 8% at the bottom have said savings, minimizing the operating costs of whatever they deliver. So uh, we will pop that uh, those results in the, uh, in the chat in a moment, and then I will stop sharing that poll. But those are your answers. Interesting. Thank you for that, Jack. I am not surprised to see that the first option is the biggest. That is a very traditional, very normal, very common scenario. And I'm also delighted to see that we didn't have lots of people in chat saying, hey, my preferred answer wasn't there. So I seem to have done a better job of capturing everyone's possible answer at, on this occasion, it seems, which is great. And the interesting thing, and perhaps the question that a lot of people are asking is saying, well, Breton, what's your answer? Or what would, if DevOps was a person attending this webinar, what would they have ticked? And the answer to that is reacting. DevOps would have said reacting is the main objective of operations in a DevOps environment. And the reason they say that is because from that power comes the ability to answer everything else, comes the ability to solve all of the other requirements. This is a lot to do with the effects of continuous delivery and the consequences on operations of continuous change. So in a high-speed delivery environment, it's paramount that those involved with keeping the lights on, delivering certainty, delivering value, minimizing costs, are always able to deal with what's getting pushed out tomorrow, the next day, the day after, et cetera. This begins with having the right culture. If we're gonna talk in a moment about various practices and methods and tactics and techniques, we have to have the right culture underpinning that to enable the people involved to behave in the way that DevOps is going to ask of them. And this means that the culture we need has to have a just or a fair attitude towards what's going on, or in particular, what's going wrong. Because what we're about to delve into really isn't the happy side of operations when everything's working perfectly. 
Uh, it's not really the interesting part of it. It's the other side. When things aren't going well, faults, failures, mistakes, dramas, problems, the important time for the culture to shine is in those negative moments. And that's when you need things to be fair and balanced. Now, that's a bit of a throwaway line, perhaps. Well, of course, we want that. But what does that really look like? Well, it means, for example, we need to have a blameless culture. And there's some specific reasons for this. This isn't just altruistic. This isn't just a case of DevOps saying, well, let's be the good guys here and not put anyone in the naughty corner. It's not that at all. It's everything in DevOps is trying to deliver a kind of result, a result that is geared around supporting that high-speed delivery. And a blameless culture means that people that make mistakes, if there's a blame culture, they will want to run and hide or they will want to keep quiet or they will maybe even want to cover up mistakes because it's grueling, difficult, unpleasant to go through the culture when that gets highlighted and made a target. That means if we're not blaming people for what's gone wrong, we need to be inquisitive about it. When we don't have that problem of blame, we have the opportunity for people to be inquisitive, to explore, and to get the answers, to learn from mistakes. Mistakes become no longer something that needs to be hunted down and removed. Mistakes become a thing that says, well, this happened, and we all need to make sure that we've maximized our learning from that. So we need to be inquisitive of everything that we can find out from that mistake. It also means we need to accept the fact that tech is hard, stuff will break, things will go wrong. And whose fault it is, is often a big open question. It's not the point as to say, well, who made a mistake? Because if a person makes a mistake, then there's a, a school of thought that says there was something available in that organization that made that mistake possible. Some of it is the raw complexity, uncertainty, inability to know everything in advance, the lack of a functioning crystal ball. It's a reality of the technology that we work with that unknowns will arrive and some of them will impact our delivery. But it also means it needs to be logical. The culture needs to be looking at the facts, looking at the information. We're not going to suffice with assumptions. We're not going to just deal with what we think happened or what we assume happened. And we're not going to focus on how we feel about it. We're just going to focus on what to do about it. And that's our goal. And what's going to line up in front of us is the steps that we need to take. And what's going to sit behind us is the culture that we've created that gives us that pathway, that allows those steps in front of us, those inquiries, those discussions, those open, honest discussions that give us the best chance of learning everything we can so that we can improve what we do next time. Because if that person doesn't make a mistake again, someone else might, because they didn't get the benefit or the opportunity to learn from the mistake that someone else made. So when we have a just and trusting objective, what we end up for, what we end up with is engineers that no longer need to hide things and cover up. That's the result in a blame culture, but we, we don't have that or need that anymore. The fear of being targeted is replaced by an opportunity to grow, share, and contribute. It means that those who are closest to the problem, which is another way of saying those who caused it, perhaps, they have the most to teach others. And DevOps recognizes the fact that the people who are actually involved in the decisions that may turn out to have been flawed or in some way were wrong or made a mistake, had a failure, they're the ones best placed to carefully articulate exactly what happened and help everyone else understand how not to make that kind of mistake again, and to inform changes in process, changes in response, changes in anything in the operations that helps them improve their resilience in the future. It means that every mistake can be learned from, and not just by the one person that made it, but by everyone else who might have also made it if they hadn't had that lesson. In DevOps, resilience 
is not the avoidance of mistakes and failures. It's not the prevention of faults. It's the seamless recovery and management of the fault and the management of the consequences of the fault in a controlled manner because DevOps accepts that it will happen. So by creating this culture, we're starting to have an environment that means that it is so safe to learn, it is so open to learn, that we can actually make this a deliberate and proactive task. We can encourage the engineers to actively and aggressively look for new discoveries, new lessons, because there is so much going on on an ongoing basis. Every deployment, every day, ongoing, something new is happening. There's something new to learn. There's a new opportunity for a fault, a mistake, or a failure. And we can miss a lot of them. If we don't have a culture that is open enough to have things raised, to have the flags raised, to have the issues discussed, shared, and talked about, we're going to miss some of them. They're going to sneak through. And that is a core contributor to our technical debt. That is where we get this accrual, this buildup of things that we didn't fix because we missed it, that eventually will bump into something else, which will cascade into something else, which will then cause some other failure with a complex series of contributing factors, which we had the opportunity to notice and act upon previously, but we didn't uh, because we're not necessarily that interested in exploring those problems. DevOps tells us that if we don't make a proactive effort to stay on top of these things, we will have a bigger and bigger problem later, and it will become harder and harder to be able to carefully manage the ongoing delivery because the complexity will not only grow in magnitude, it'll grow in difficulty. So the culture of this says that every engineer is not just encouraged, is obliged to proactively hunt down the answers that tell the story about what does this mean and what do we do about it? And yes, sometimes the answer is it doesn't mean very much and we're not going to do anything about it. But we checked and we know. And perhaps even from that process, we learned something else, something we didn't even know to look for that has told us that something else might be not quite right, not quite useful, not quite perfect that needs to be acted upon or responded to. So we have a mechanism within DevOps that is an item or a thing called the retrospective review meeting. That's just a name for it. It's definitely associated with retrospectives, but it might have a variety of actual names. What it is, is a process that we should go through every time we have a fault, a failure, an issue. And it doesn't matter whether it's because someone made a mistake or something else. That's not really the point. The point is we have a official process to go through to try and figure out what's happening. Three questions that we ask. One, what really happened? Secondly, why did that happen? What are the influencing factors? And third, what do we do about it? Now, I'm going to go through and explain what happens in a retrospective, and then we'll see if we can take some questions that might be popping up by then. So let's cover that first. The fault retrospective, which is another label for it. This is a process that says we do certain things when something has gone wrong. The first thing we want is the facts. We want to create a timeline of events. We need the reports. This goes all the way back to what we previously talked about with things like telemetry and monitoring. But we also need to make sure that the different perspectives about what people saw or what people believed all have an opportunity to be shared, expressed, and merged and aligned with the facts that are available. We make sure we do the process of breaking down the assumptions and say, this is what actually happened. And everyone involved knows that. But we also make sure that we get the contributions from people that might have unique knowledge, a unique role to play, including perhaps people that may have been instrumental in making the problem exist or become worse. A safety environment where they have an opportunity to say, okay, this is what I did. This is what I tried to do. This is what I thought I was doing. This is what I thought was happening. And this is what happened. And this is the part that absolutely has to be blameless 
because you need every scrap of contribution from people in that situation that you can possibly get. Then we want to empower those people who have the most knowledge about what happened to take the opportunity to step forward and take a leading role in helping others understand what they did and what happened or what didn't happen or whatever the circumstances were at the time. Because they might have a unique and only perspective that helps everyone else really understand that potentially obscure little moment that led to something going wrong. So we need to accept during these meetings that we're not judging a decision. If we judge a decision, we're really kind of judging the person that made it. We review a decision, and that lets us review the influences on that decision that might have been misinterpreted. So we have to keep in mind that whatever decisions were made were made without the benefit of hindsight. And so we have to avoid the temptation of judging those decisions with hindsight. And lastly, we've got to make decisions of what to do about it. We need to resolve. We need to have a plan. We need to maybe change something and maybe not change things. Maybe it's as simple as just making sure everyone knows don't do that. Perhaps. Or maybe it's a case of saying, well, that was, that happened. And that was a reasonable thing for that person to have done in that time. That's not a strange decision. So we need to change the circumstances so that that's less likely, that has some safety rails, that has some warning flags. Let's do something about that, whatever it may be. So this is one of the tools that's going to lead us into a discussion in a moment about some more deliberate failure techniques that we can work with. But I want to check in with you, Jack, and see if we have some questions that have popped up that we might be answering now. We do. We have got a couple that are along the same lines, just looking for some clarification. Jimmy's asked, wouldn't RRM also be like a PIR, post-incident review? Christopher has asked, would you distinguish between a, retros a retrospective and a problem review? And Gihan has asked, is the fault retrospective the same as the post-incident review? Yes. That's what I was alluding to when I was talking about the fact that you can have different terminology. And it often depends on what part of the world you're in at the time. So the post-incident reviews, uh, retrospective meetings, uh, you can have all these different things that really are the same thing. If it follows these principles and has this kind of activity in it, it's got the same purpose. It is the same thing. It might just be labeled differently. And your organization may emphasize some of these differently or handle them differently. But yes, it's job is to review the incident and review it in a cultural way that maximizes these opportunities. It's generally done as soon as possible after the incident has been resolved. You don't do it during the resolution because it just becomes a distraction. You do it when you've got some sort of safe environment, things have settled, and then, but you want to do it soon after that because you want to maximize the opportunity of capturing the difference between cause and effect. What happened and what did that do? You want to make sure that everyone's memory of that is freshest when you have these sorts of discussions. So yes, it's the same. Great. Fantastic. Always good to have some of that terminology cleared up. So we've also got a question from Leo asking, uh, should we have tools that help us capture when things go wrong so it allows us to learn how to incorporate and use feedback loops to assist in future? I suspect that there might be some tools, some of which may have been mentioned previously, uh, that might fit into this, but would you like to give us any sort of specifics around that? So yes, there are tools that happen in a couple of layers. You have monitoring tools and telemetry tools that are bringing things to people's attention. So there's, there's that kind of tool, but you also might have tools that allow for the investigation. You might have diagnostic tools. You might have tools that help you gather the facts delve deeper into the monitoring and the big data that you might have about it. So you might have another bunch of tools that you only turn on when you start delving. Uh, you also are going to have tools that touch on things that we're going to cover in more detail in a short while, which is how you share this. So you'll have tools that'll be like a central repository of information that comes out of this that helps people look, refer back to it. It's got to be searchable. It's got to be centralized and 
all of the knowledge that comes out of these have to be able to be accessed and useful in some way to others, not just the people that happen to be present during the conversation. So all of those are going to have tools that will help do that. And every organization might be a little different. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a question asking about the logical part of uh, the culture slide, I believe it is. And this question, back, it? it's yeah. a little, it's a little while back. Yes. There it is. Uh, yep. Yes. Logical being the last dot point here. Neville's asked, RE logical. If it's not about how we feel about it, then what about how we feel about the response? You can't easily help feeling. So it's not to say that, you know, we can't be human about it. It's not to say that you know, there can't be frustrations. What it is meant to say is that the frustrations are not a useful tool in expanding and growing what we do. Um, worse and more powerful emotions are not helpful and beneficial. They shouldn't be part of the process. They shouldn't be encouraged. When we're talking about culture, we're talking about encouragement. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about setting an example. And this means that a leader isn't demonstrating their anger and frustration as a primary response, which then others might follow as, oh, let's all get angry about this because so-and-so did what they shouldn't have done. That's unhelpful. And that's why the culture is meant to diminish that. But it's not meant to say that we're robotic about it. And that's why it's actually listed here because it's not always easy. And we often have to remind ourselves and remind each other that it's not about the emotional response because the emotional response isn't gonna help us make do a better job next time. So that's why it's presented in that way. Great, thank you. And just finally, I think it's a good follow on from that question. Sarah has asked, how can this DevOps culture be incorporated into the organization, top down or bottom up? Which I think you addressed slightly last week, but I think it might be good yeah. to just briefly touch on in relation to uh, these discussions around culture? My view is that it, for it to work, it absolutely has to be top down. It has to be endorsed and it has to be championed and led from the top. But like any good methodology change, you ultimately need your champions all the way down. You, in every layer, you need people that are early adopters. You need people that are willing to be change champions. You need people that are willing to embrace, embody, and espouse these ideals and it's not going to be successful. Well, it's not going to be as quick if you don't have those as well. So they are hugely important, the bottom-up perspective in getting on board, but you also have a few at different layers that will be reluctant, they'll push back, and that's why you have to have a mandate that comes from the top. But then you also need the buy-in strategies. You need to help people change. There does need to be change management if you're moving into this environment. It is not simply a policy. It absolutely is a culture, and that's why people need to be changed carefully and willingly. So it's not it's not easy for organizations that are not ready for it. Great answer. I think it's really interesting to think about the interplay between policy and culture because they can be so influential on each other, but one can't necessarily change or culture can't really change particularly quickly without a policy change, but then the actions yep. that are taken sometimes are not that different despite a policy change if the culture hasn't changed with it. So thank you for touching on that yeah. again. And it does take time. Great. Thank you very Excellent. much. Excellent. All right, let's move forward and we'll capture some more questions a bit later. So we've talked about a culture that enables investigation without recrimination. We've talked about processes that provide ample information. And we're just talking about things that we know are a problem. But sometimes there's something that could be done, but we don't yet know that it's a problem. These are the weak failure signals. These are the, the what ifs, the maybes. These are things like near misses. The thing that didn't cause a problem, but on another day, it might. And the easier we make it to talk about things that actually went wrong without blame and recrimination, the easier it is to talk about things that didn't go wrong, but still needs some attention. And somebody might need to take a step, make an action, initiate a conversation about something that's not quite right, not quite good, or not good enough, a potential failure. 
So there's a cascading effect of opening up and creating these freedoms, creating this curiosity, creating a desire to know and understand all these anomalies. This hunger that we might have to understand the anomalies means that you have this additional safety net for anything else that might be hiding underneath the blanket. Now, then we start to say, well, okay, we've got this great environment. It's positive. It's, it's empowering. It's open. It's, it's willing to explore anything that might be, that might have gone wrong or that maybe will go wrong. The next step is to say, well, maybe we should make it go wrong. Maybe we should actually experiment. This is where we start to get into the exciting world of deliberate failure within DevOps. So operations historically have been guardians of the system, of the operations, of the live environment. But in DevOps, that's not really enough. Resilience is not protection. Resilience is recovery because we're changing the environment maybe every day. We need a strategy that helps us respond differently every day, every week, every month, has to evolve. So this means that in order to be ahead of this complexity, we have to be gaining the experience that helps us know that, well, when this happens, these other 25 things happen, or this is the challenges, this is the problem. How do we know this? How do we get to learn this? How do we get this experience? The only way to become true masters of failure is to cause enough of it that we learn how to fix it. Now, bear with me, those of you who are slightly recoiling or struggling to stay on your seat, bear with me because there's a bit more to talk about. I want to talk about this from what if operations teams were superheroes, like the superheroes we know about, right? Back in the olden days, they were the Avengers. Operations were the people that said, if you harm our system, we'll get you. We will avenge what you've done. Then moving forward, the next step in their evolution, they became the guardians of the galaxy, protecting their systems ferociously, making sure that nothing really ever gets in. They learned how to do that and they were able to guard and protect their stuff. In DevOps, they become the X-Men. They cause so much of their own trouble that they get really good at fixing it. So this is my analogy of superhero groups. Now, for those of you who are wondering, anyone wondering who are the developers? <laughs> if the developers were a super group in all of this, they're going to be the fantastic four because there's the one person who's probably the smartest person in the room. There's another person who works at such incredible speeds that they set everything alight. There's a third person who seems to be impervious to everything going on around them. And then there's a person that might as well be invisible because you can never find them when you need them. That's a powerful developer team. And yet they keep saving the world like all hero teams do. So using this analogy, the concepts behind deliberate failure, what am I really talking about? Well, we do deliberately break things in production on purpose. Why? Because we've done everything and put everything that we think we need to have in place that means that when that goes wrong, it'll be okay, right? Probably, maybe, well, we hope so. When do we usually find out whether or not that's okay? Is when the inevitable happens and something actually breaks. In the DevOps environment, we're gonna break it now, us here actually break something in that production environment. And it's going to be under controlled conditions. It's going to be when we're ready. It's going to be when everything is there. Everyone's on standby. We're ready for it. We know it's going to happen. And then we go, plink, and then we deal with it. And we put into place all the things that we thought we had ready. And then we monitor closely everything that actually happens. We monitor all of the things that we thought were going to fix that. The responses, the reactions, the, 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 the failovers, the cutovers, the backups, the this, the that, did it really happen exactly the way we thought it would? We review that like we review everything, and then we make some changes. This is an endless cycle. Because in the DevOps environment, what operations teams are doing on an ongoing basis is constantly evolving 
their ability to respond to anything, any problem that might occur. And they get that experience by triggering those events in controlled environments. Now, of course, you're not going to trigger a thing on purpose that you know you're not ready for, that you just, you're not going to be able to handle that. You trigger the things that you think you've got everything sorted. So in, in theory, you think you've got everything sorted. This shouldn't hurt. And you do it on a time, at a date, at a place where if it does hurt, you've got a backup plan for that too, right? You can switch off the fire, perhaps, if you have to. But you get to learn all the things that you didn't even imagine might go wrong or happen or make it difficult until you actually do it. I mean, how many times have we all seen the famous disaster recovery plans that never actually work when the disaster comes along because they weren't tested and something in that disaster plan was purely theoretical and it never actually survives contact with the disaster? In DevOps, we're looking at that problem on a regular basis, daily basis, frequent basis, and we're learning from it all the time. A story, a great story about Netflix and their little program called Chaos Monkey. The Chaos Monkey is a program that deliberately goes around shutting down random services in the Netflix network, just randomly shuts stuff off and forces the humans to react to that, forces them to activate their response plans. Now, a lot of those response plans are automated, scripted, built in, they just happen. And the humans, are just monitoring, checking, looking, and saying, well, yes, that, that happened. This, this automatic failover correctly took place. Thanks, Chaos Monkey. Nothing really went wrong. All of the things that we hope are going to create resilience might have worked, or maybe they didn't, and we're glad we know about it. I put an example that's one of my favorites in the pre-recorded audio, where uh, Google had some interesting environments, an interesting situation. And this is more of a, of a bigger scale thing. This is a a game day problem. Actually, I'll get to that in a moment. What we're trying to do with DevOps is we're trying to have a, what we call a graceful degradation of services. The goal is not to prevent things from going wrong. The goal is to be in complete control of what happens next when something goes wrong, because it will, and you won't be able to stop it. You won't be able to predict it. You won't even know what it is but you'll know the consequences and your systems will know the consequences and you can be completely in control of everything that happens after that. And it could be graceful even when it's bad. So even when you have to reduce performance, reduce capacity, reduce functionality, it happens automatically, smoothly, quickly and easily and in exactly the way you wanted it to happen because you planned it, you set it up, you organized it. And you knew that because you've been through it. And if you hadn't been through it, you wouldn't have had that degree of control. One little tiny example that Netflix has. When they had a failure or a limitation of CPU cycles on certain processes, what did they do? They didn't want to stop the streaming. So they have a system that turns off other features like the little bit of CPU programming that tells you where your, what your favorites are, what you've recently watched how that normally appears when you first turn on your Netflix. That's what I'm watching lately. The CPU cycles that process that out of your profile, that's an example of something that would be one of the first things that gets switched off when CPU cycles are short. Because that's not an important feature. Watching your favorite show is. How do you do that? How do you know that? How do you know how to do that? Unless you've deliberately caused yourself to run out of CPU cycles. Let's talk about game days. This is where I was alluding to a moment ago. Game days are the big failure, the big things, the massive failure. The game days is where you turn off an entire data center. Google does that. They literally cut the power to a data center. Why? Because well, they've got lots, there's others, and they're meant to be ready for that, right? They're meant to have everything in place that says when this happens, everything else will just pick up the slack and it'll be fine. But a game day is when you prepare for something at that scale and it's everybody involved. It's all hands, it's all departments, it's everyone that you need is going to be there ready and available because it's big 
and everyone needs to learn from it and everyone needs to be ready for it. So it's carefully planned. People involved know exactly what's going to happen and they've had plenty of time to carefully water all of their plans ready to go. It's heavily monitored, like incredibly so, because everyone's watching to see how everything happens. And this is where you discover all these little fun things that you never really thought, because it's impossible to truly imagine every possible secondary, third, tertiary consequence of a disaster of this scale. And we have a detailed analysis of it, of course. Now, the example I was going to give you a moment ago was when Google did one of these once, and they had a game day where they literally cut power to a data center. Yes, the diesel generators kicked in and started supplying power. Terrific. But what happens when those diesel generators run out of diesel? They found out they don't have an emergency purchasing program to buy diesel. So somebody used a personal credit card to purchase $50,000 worth of diesel that day. They fixed their processes, but that's what they had to do. These are the kinds of discoveries that organizations, even as big as Google, get to make because they cut the power to a data center on purpose. What we have to learn from it will be unique to our organization. So when we think about deliberate failure, we think about making sure that we know what happens when things go wrong. Out of that, we might get information that says, you know what, the way we do this thing, that needs to improve. Or this is a weakness. This is a problem. This is harder than it should be. We've got some underlying issues in how we do our thing, and they're worth fixing. No, we're not talking about building the next feature to deliver to our customers. We're talking about how we do our daily stuff deserves a little bit of TLC, a little bit of improvement, a little bit of love. So there's a concept that says, well, in DevOps, we need to have periodical pauses where we stop and say, you know what? Stop delivering new stuff. Go back a step and let's make an effort and invest in fixing what we do. This thing under here. Maybe we only know about it because of something big that we deliberately investigated. This is operational improvement. There's a number of phrases for it. You can call it uh, improvement blitz. You can call it a hackathon. Uh, you can call it other stuff. It's where for a period of time, and it might be days, or it might be a week or two, all new development of features is paused. So value delivery comes to a stop. And then you focus on fixing something that's painful about how you do your thing. You fix a tool, you fix some automated scripts, you uh, fix some communication flows, you fix a repository or a database or something that makes your life harder and that that's a growing problem. You fix technical debt. And that agenda of what do we fix during this blitz, that gets decided by the people involved. It's a little bit of a popularity contest, but there's also other elements that might come in to say, well, no, InfoSec has a thing that says this is really important, or Ops says this is really high risk, or Leadership and execs might say, this is a big cost. Something might be a driving force, but it has to be something that the people involved want to fix. They're the ones that are actually doing it. So the agenda is determined by collective agreement and it's only biting off what we can chew in that particular period of time, which is not a problem because there'll be another one shortly, soon as soon as we need it, or on maybe on a rotating schedule. And everyone that can, should be involved, gets involved and is empowered to contribute. This is one of the principles that began way back in the beginning of Lean, decades ago. It was recognized that often the most effective, capable, and valuable contributors to figuring out how to do it better were the people at the assembly line doing it every day. They were often the people who had the most to offer when it came to figuring out what can we do better? 
And the same thing applies here. It's the same kind of principle that says, be inclusive. Get all the stakeholders to have the opportunity to say, oh, what about this? So we've gone forward, having said that we have a good learning culture. We've said, well, we have a blameless environment where people have the opportunity to simply openly share and talk about mistakes. And we have a process that helps us understand those mistakes, review them. But then we have more than that. We have a deliberate intention to go and hunt down the stuff that actually didn't go wrong, but we kind of saw it. It popped up on someone's radar and they got to flag that. Then we move to a situation where we're actually causing our own problems. We're triggering our own alerts and we're learning from that experience as well, even on a massive scale, if necessary. Ultimately, there are many ways that we can gain knowledge and understanding. And eventually, we need to share the lesson. The information we gather must have visibility. It must have various ways and places that we can put it and do things with it that enable others to find it. You might have a central repository of code. You might have a central searchable database of all of your incident reviews or retrospective reports. All of those game days, all of those deliberate failures are visible and indexable. You might have groups that get created that are working functional groups that continue after the failure, after the game day. And they might continue to, to collaborate because they found a way of working together, a need to work together, a need to communicate. That might mean that they are able to continually look for and find ways to improve their functional activities, their outcomes. They might be informal working groups, and that might happen within the organization, or it might become people of a similar nature that are outside of the organization, but are learning techniques and methods from each other. The learning should be experiential. It should be hands-on. It should be practical. It should be relevant. It's not merely traditional classroom teaching or digital online learning. It's not theoretical and academic. It's meant to be workshops. It's meant to be mentoring. It's meant to be hands-on instructional, or it's meant to be trial and error. And everyone, everyone involved has something that might be useful to add. And they're empowered to be part of that sharing process. Even if it's simple as updating a record, updating a log, updating an event log, providing an explanation for something. It might even go so far as actually explaining and sharing information that others then read and understand. But it's open and it's encompassing. There is something that is called the learning loop, the ASRED's learning loop. It's from a book, uh, Sooner, Safer, Happier, by the authors listed below. It's just another way of describing a loop of learning. It's a useful one here because although these are logical steps, there's a couple of things in it that are presented in a way that are quite useful from a DevOps point of view. So you, in the beginning of learning something, you have to align with the context, align with the situation, align with the relevant factors that are applicable to us. You make sure that what you're trying to understand is anchored in the alignment of the people involved. Then the sense is understanding the various context and influencing factors. What are the contributing forces that we need to take into account? What matters here? What, what are all the things that are contributors to what's going on that we should take into account and understand? This is a sense, and this is broad. This isn't just what are the facts. This is the everything that might contribute to it. The response is decisions. We respond by making a decision that says, well, given what we've sensed, what should we do? Now let's try. This is the experiment. The experiment says, well, when this happened, this broke in our system. And due to our sense, we're not just saying, oh, well, Fred did that, blame Fred. We're saying, well, no, this happened because of these other factors and this was missing and Fred didn't have that knowledge or information and 
someone wasn't available. So now we're going to make a decision what we're going to do about it so that it won't happen next time. We're going to experiment that. And then in DevOps, we're going to trigger that problem. We're going to make it happen again and see if our experiment worked. And when it does, and when we're happy with it, then we will distill that and make it a part of the regular operational responses. It's our normal now. And then let everyone know about it. Now, there's a certain logic in this. Uh, there are various other learning loops that will do and say a similar thing. But the DevOps environment is essentially saying to us, well, learn as much as you can. Take it on board without prejudgment. Learn and share as much of it. Make your decisions. Experiment when you don't have all the facts. Experiment when you think you know everything because you'll learn something that you didn't actually know and constantly, continually evolve what you do. Because we know that the technology is going to change. We don't know what services we're going to be offering in the future. We don't know what our customers are going to want. We don't know what management's going to want. We don't know what the industry is going to do, what the world is going to do, or what it's going to ask us. But in DevOps, one thing we do know is that whatever we need to do, we're going to do it better than it's ever been done before. Because whatever we did wrong yesterday, we're going to do it better tomorrow and then better the next day, because that is an intrinsic part of what DevOps is all about. Try, fix, try again. We have a final poll as we wrap up. Jack, are we able to uh, put that up whilst I ask people who still Already have done. some questions? <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Whilst we pause and give people the opportunity to put any questions up that they might have. I want to ask people which of the four topics uh, that they might have gotten the most out of uh, or enjoyed the most or appreciated the most. Um, that's for my benefit. Very curious about that. Love to hear what everyone feels about that if you have a view. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a all of the above in that question. Uh, you, you, you have to pick one, I'm afraid. And whilst we do that, um, perhaps, Jack, is it? are we ready to tackle some questions? I think uh, I'm certainly ready to tackle some questions. Uh, really quickly, uh, just letting people have a quick reminder that if you've got questions that are around the logistics or the, the way that the course is run, et cetera, feel free to direct those to the chat section rather than Q&A. We will go over the details of things like the exam and when the quiz uh, and, and such will be uploaded in just a little while when we finish the actual kind of meat and potatoes of the course itself. But rest assured, there will be plenty of opportunities to ask questions for Kit and myself to answer about the way that the exam and whatnot is run in just a moment. Uh, but I would say, should we should we start from the most recent questions? Sure. Leo has asked, with graceful degradation, don't you try it at a time when there isn't much use of the systems to reduce the impact? Yes, definitely. And we didn't go into those details uh, due to the time we spent on that topic. But uh, Leo is absolutely right. When you start to make the controlled planning, careful decisions about what deliberate failures do you create and when you'll make them based on things like limiting the impact but also there's a trade-off with making sure that there's resource availability so you're not necessarily going to do it at 3 a.m you might do it at a slightly more reasonable time like 7 a.m or 6 a.m or something like that as an example but yes leo is absolutely right you you will pick and choose based on minimizing your risk of escalating this problem Great. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Christi uh, Christopher, sorry, has asked, could you say that this is service continuity testing, but on a more frequent scale? Believe that that was uh, referring to a similar topic. Yes, uh, I think so. And it's an example of different phraseology or different terminology uh, that is already in use with similar ideals that mean much the same thing. I've presented this in what might be a more confronting way. And that's because of the context in which this short course is, is presented. Uh, but uh, I think Christopher's idea is, is correct. Uh, you could describe this as service continuity testing because you're 
deliberately doing things that are testing the continuity of the service. The important thing with DevOps is that you're doing that in a live system. You're not doing that in an alternate or backup or secondary system. You're doing it in live production. And we are all assuming that you're dealing with a live production that does in fact have a backup of some kind or a failover of some kind. Uh, so yes, you could call it that uh, or other things as well. Some of you might already be doing something similar and calling it something else. Great, thanks very much. We've got two questions for a from Leo. First, they're slightly different, but they're from the same person. So I'm gonna ask them together. Leo has asked in one question, if there is any room for an adjudicator in the retrospective review, and also would like to know if chaos theory is something inclusive to uh, included in DevOps. So the room for the adjudicator, it's actually often recommended for teams that are new to retrospectives and this process. So when their culture is in a state of transition, uh, an adjudicator or not necessarily an adjudicator by name, but a neutral party, someone who's not a stakeholder uh, in what actually happened could often be a good facilitator, which is perhaps a better word. And having that neutral party involved to facilitate those the neutral objectives of a retrospective uh, can definitely be helpful for organizations that aren't used to it yet, where as humans, we're still reacting with a little bit of habit or a little bit of instinct, and we need some help to moderate or temper that. When it comes to chaos theory, uh, I'm not too sure if there's a direct relationship. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, that all of chaos theory is applicable, but you know, chaos theory is such a broad concept that I think it could apply to you can apply it to almost any aspect of the human condition because uh, the human brain functions often under what we would call chaos theory. There's a randomness to what we do, uh, but there's also a craving of order. And so when you start to bring in things like the second law of nature, uh, in contrast, you start to say, well, we are chaotic beings, we're dealing with chaotic technology, and yet we are always applying an external force, which is ending up in a degree of order. And between those two, you have a balance or a state of flux. And where DevOps sits is to say, technology is inherently chaotic. Let's leverage that. Whereas previous methodologies have said, let's control that. Let's contain it. DevOps saying, let's use it to our advantage. Let's learn from it. Let's be the masters of that uncertainty by having a reaction plan rather than trying to forcibly introduce certainty that doesn't really belong. Interesting. That's really interesting. Thank you very much for that. We've Welcome. got a couple of questions from earlier on. Uh, yeah. The first being, is it possible for a developer to also do the operations or should duties be segregated, which I think kind of goes little to the heart of DevOps, doesn't it? Yeah. So I'm, I've split them up in our subject here in our course because I wanted to create a contextual perspective in one week and then create a different one in the next week. However, one of the things we did talk about uh, when we talked about uh, flow and feedback is from that perspective of deployments that developers get involved in fixing deployments. And so there's a, an enormous, enormous overlap where operational faults, failures and, and issues are linked to a development or deployment situation. You absolutely need the developers involved to actually do that troubleshooting and say, okay, something's gone wrong because of a new piece of code that we just pushed out there you need the code writers to come and help you fix that. And most definitely, you, you might find that developers are doing most of the heavy lifting on the diagnosis and decision-making and the reviews of what actually happened here because it's mostly within their environment. But that's only when that's appropriate. There may be other circumstances where it's not due to a change in the code. There is something else that's happened. It could be hardware related. It could be configuration related. It could be database related. And then you'll only call in devs as one of the resources that you might need to figure it out. You might bring them in as part of the response and say, our response to this is that 
we need you to code this a little bit differently in next time. Or maybe it's an internal thing that says, we need to change our automated testing and telemetry scripts here. Or we need a dev to come and help us do that. But it's not universal. Uh, when the people step over and do other things, DevOps doesn't necessarily prescribe. It just says, whatever you need, whenever you need it. Right, thank you. Gahan has asked, uh, what is the difference between infrastructure team and operations team? In my organization, all environments are maintained by the infra team and aren't involved much with the development team. Operations team work closely with the developers, but their scope is automated testing, CI slash CD pipelines, et cetera. Is this common? The last part, I'm not sure how common it is, but I do believe it's less common. I do think that what Johan is talking about with the closely linked operations versus developers is an echo of a lot of what DevOps recommends and talks about. That uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment paradigm where things are constantly pushing out there, but you have less frequent changes on the infrastructure layer. You're not necessarily scoping out new capacity from a hardware perspective as often as you are pushing out code. But there does need to be a relationship. There does need to be a, a synergy of understanding. Even when you have virtualized infrastructure and adding more hardware is like dragging a slider on a config panel, you still need to have a, a, a degree of interplay between the expertise that's involved. So what DevOps is fundamentally saying is that the original barrier that we're all kind of familiar with between developers and operations, we're breaking that down in a structural and fundamental way. And we're creating bridges between us that help us stomp down that barrier. When there's a barrier back to architecture, we need to have a similar philosophy that says, well, we don't need that barrier any bigger than it has to be. We don't want uh, silos. We don't want obstacles. And sometimes you find that infrastructure is a component of operations. And that's depending on the organizational structure. In a lot of cases where I've seen it, you do actually have that piece where infrastructure is just a piece of operations, just like database architecture is a piece, or just like InfoSec is a piece of just making sure on the daily basis that things are okay. Infrastructure often has longer lead times for some things. So they have different imperatives and different problems to solve. But I don't think that there needs to be a starkly different way in which infrastructure works with either developers or operations. And I think the, you know, let's get together and decide what we need paradigm of DevOps is still a good way to go. I see. We've got another question. Yeah, we've got a few more. Uh, Harish has asked earlier on, agile methodology is there in both project management and DevOps? How will you uh, differentiate both of them? So I view agile as the, as the parental relationship. And underneath that, from a project management point of view, you have examples like Scrum. Uh, you have uh, all forms of iterative uh, based development of new things. They are empirical in nature. So they are methodologies that allow for experiment and discovery. And there's various other forms that might be devoted to other technology. You have things like extreme programming uh, and variations that are based on the higher principles of agile. When you look at DevOps, uh, DevOps is a value stream. Usually projects are defined by having a start and an end date. And uh, usually there's a big upheaval and change in between. Whereas in the value stream environment, it's typically a never ending, long term at least. And so the principles that you might use in a project, not all of them apply in a value stream environment. So DevOps is a way of saying, well, we're also agile because we're using some of the same principles that came out of the early days of lean and agility that were borrowed and used by Scrum and XP. And we're using them in a more continual delivery model perhaps a little more like Lean and Kanban have done, but all still sitting under the great parenthood of agile philosophies. Interesting. I've never heard that conceptualized as a parental type relationship before. I think that's 
really interesting way of putting it. Uh, Joey's asked, for security consideration, some organizations don't allow developers access prod, uh, developers to access prod data. In this case, how could developers help ops with troubleshooting when needed? Organizations that I've seen that have highly strict production data that's meant to be segregated in that way have, uh, there's a number of ways you can do it. Uh, you can have obfuscation methods where uh, certain information is accessible, but it's anonymized or it's obfuscated in a way that makes it less dangerous. It makes it less problematic. Uh, so you can have the presentation of data that is obscured in a way that doesn't breach security. But you're still going to have other concerns that say, well, we're only going to do this in strict environments. We're only going to do this in limited situations. We're only going to do this on secure equipment that's protected. You might also have a situation where if you're troubleshooting something, uh, you're not necessarily troubleshooting it after the fact on an operational environment. You don't necessarily have to. There's some things that you can do in your staging environment. Once the problem's actually solved, and you're doing your retrospective to say, well, what actually happened? And we have to do some stuff without sensitive data. You might have a staging environment that has a copy of fake data that you can work with. And that may or may not give you the information you need. Sometimes it won't. So usually in that situation, organizations that are and know that they are dependent upon the need to troubleshoot from a developer's perspective on data that might be secure, they need to go through processes that get the right level of infosec clearance on some people that are working in that situation. Because it might simply be a practical infeasibility to say that, oh, well, you need to fix this, but you can't look at it. And something has to give out of that. And it really depends on which end of the rope you happen to be hanging on to. Uh, but if you don't meet in the middle of that rope, then ultimately you're going to have it a much longer, harder time in diagnosing, troubleshooting, and fixing. And that might actually be a price that organizations are willing to pay to not compromise any of those security barriers. Right, okay. Uh, we've got a couple more questions about, one, one further question about security, asking how do you ensure security in the DevOps environment? Well, your environment is still internal. It's still assumed to be secure in the sense that you're not talking about outside the network. You're still meant to be in an environment that's considered to be secure. So there's there's that side of it in terms of the work that's being done. But when you talk about, for example, secure data or access to secure things that, that create new risks, then that's a process that the organization needs to decide on what are its protocols, what's its security risks appetite? What is it prepared to deal with? Uh, it's a very, it's a broad question with a broad answer because it really depends on what you're trying to secure and who are you. Uh, if you're a military uh, institution that is protecting military secrets, you're going to have a different approach than a retail organization that's trying to protect customer address information, for example. Uh, so how you do it doesn't really change with DevOps, uh, other than the fact that things are happening much faster. And one of the things that I've certainly seen with uh, security is that security often take their time because they have a lot of things to think about and a lot of things to check and a lot of things to worry about. And so historically DevOps, it, 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 DevOps or not, security has been a bit slower to respond to requests, answers for information, et cetera. In the DevOps environment, the company has to find a way to speed that up. And that might mean increasing the investment in the resources that are dealing with InfoSec. If they need to be able to do their job at a much faster pace, then they need the tools, the systems, et cetera, to do that. And unlike in development where you can just throw in masses of automation to improve your testing, you can't really do that with security. Uh, sometimes you do need simply to have more resources if you want to do it faster and not lose quality. Okay, and we've got one further question asking, I feel like DevOps is more related to the workload domain, operating systems and applications. I work in physical infrastructure, hosts, storage, physical networks, and bring them together in a private cloud. 
Is there a place for DevOps in this kind of environment on the backend infrastructure? When you're looking at configuration of those issues, you're looking at soft systems. Uh, you're looking at uh, logic. You're looking at algorithms. When you start to look at that, then maybe there's a place even there for a DevOps environment. Because once you start to get to a point where logical algorithms have to function, code has to function, it has to do a job and that job has value and it has to do it in a certain way. You're starting to deliver value on an ongoing basis in a way that requires uh, configurable updates. If it's something you never change, then maybe DevOps is gonna be a lot less useful in that environment. But the more we virtualize these things and the more we need software to help manage the virtualization, the more we're going to have something that might need regular servicing, regular management, regular updating, regular development, regular de deployment, then you might well be in the same situation. So it's a question of saying, well, uh, from an old fashioned perspective, to say, well, no, no, this is, this is hardware. But you know, are we really just talking about hardware? Or are we talking about hardware and firmware? Or are we talking about hardware, firmware, operating system? Or are we talking about other scripts, algorithms, kernels, things that might run on it as well? That's when you say, well, maybe we can benefit from at least some of what DevOps is suggesting. Great. Well, that was our last question. Just letting everybody know that the Q&A is now closed. If you've got further questions, feel free to direct them to the forums where Brenton and other participants will be able to discuss and answer your questions. Just uh, looking at the poll now, which was open mm. for quite some time. I've just shared the, it and yeah. Yeah. Number four. Learning. And then number two, number one and number three, potentially a sl slight amount of recency bias involved in there in terms of people are currently enjoying the delightful content of topic number four, but also very interesting as well. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you everyone for uh, contributing that info. Very interesting, very useful. Brilliant. And thank you everyone for coming along to one or more of the sessions for this DevOps short course. Just a reminder that all of the content for the short course will continue to be available on learn.itmasters.edu.au. Uh, specifically letting people know as well, just a heads up that currently uh, in Victoria, where IT Masters is based, we are in the middle of two public holidays in a row. So while we will endeavor to get the recordings for tonight up and uh, available to everybody as soon as possible, there may be a slight delay just for this week. It won't affect your ability to take exams or anything else. Uh, and speaking of additional IT Masters resources, which is the slide which is currently on the screen. If people are interested in continuing their learning with ITM and CSU, particularly people who found this week's content or this week's short, co short course the most interesting, if you'd like to go deeper into subjects like this, we have a wide variety of other short courses that are available, uh, archived on learn.itmasters.edu.au. And also letting you know that the content for our short courses is taken directly from our postgraduate IT subjects. So we offer graduate certificates or master's degrees in uh, the fields of cloud computing and virtualization, cybersecurity, networking and systems administration, project management, uh, business administration or the MBA, digital marketing, project management, which I may have said twice, or uh, the Graduate Certificate in Computing Career Transition, which is fantastic for people who are just beginning their IT kind of journey. We've got a number of subjects that are run by Brenton, if you've enjoyed his fantastic presentation style, and other subjects which are also developed by Brenton. So if you're interested in that, feel free to fill out an eligibility assessment form, which uh, the link has just been dropped in the chat by Kit. Thank you very much. Can and feel free to stuff. get in. Yeah, feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, related to the exam, the exam 
does not necessarily have an end date. So I saw somebody ask a question about when uh, you would be able to submit the exam. You can continue to take the exam. It is one hour in duration, is multiple choice. You have one attempt at the exam and it does not need to be done before 12 noon tomorrow, as somebody has said in the chat. I do not believe that it is currently available. Uh, so it has a one hour timer, right? One hour timer, Once yes. you start it, but you can start it at any point you want in the future. There's, Thank there's you, no yes. window that it, it closes and you can't do it. Is that right? That is right. Yes, that's mm, correct. Okay. Uh, Kit, feel free to uh, correct me in the Slack channel if I'm incorrect there, but that is generally the way. It will be available soon, potentially not within the next 24 hours, but again, Please do not panic about that. It is not necessary to do before a certain time frame. You are absolutely still able to get your certificate for having completed the exam whenever it is that you complete the exam itself. So a not survey, a problem Jen? there. There do, is do a we, survey. Yeah, do we ask you read my mind. Yeah, we would I'd, love I'd some love feedback to. as well. Yes. So yeah. If you feel like Michael, who's just said in the chat that this course was a valuable use of scarce and uncertain lifetime, very momentous way to put that, feel free to drop in your feedback. The survey about the course content and your experience with the course is available via the link that has just been dropped in the chat by Kit. It is available on learn.itmasters.edu.au. And we really do appreciate it when people fill out the surveys. It gives us really valuable information on what people get out of these short courses, what we can do to improve your experience and the delivery of the short courses, and as well as the kind of content that people would like to see in upcoming courses as well. So please do take the time to fill out the survey. It's not very long, it's very easy to do so. And it will help us improve your experience with us in the future. So thank you very much in advance for filling out the survey. It's Did you have anything to, uh, else? Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I, surveys are wonderful from my perspective because it's great to hear what people are looking for. And the, the, the constructive feedback is always great to help evolve these things. And the positive feedback is always great motivation to be excited and enthusiastic about doing it all again. So all sorts of feedback is hugely valuable. So. Fantastic. So once again, thanks everyone for attending. We really, really appreciate the time and energy that you put in to engaging with this kind of content. It's very valuable for us. Please fill out the survey. Let us know if you have any feedback or anything. Fill out the eligibility assessment form if you'd like to study with us in the future. And in the meantime, thank you very, very much, Kit, for all of your technical support and logistical uh, energies behind the scenes. And thank you, round of applause virtually, all of us in our own homes around the world, for Brenton for such fantastic content. It was wonderful to get to witness it, to get to experience this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Uh, thank you, Kit, for all of your back-end support. And thank you, everyone, for all of the chat. Uh, all of the comments in the forums in the chat window all of the great questions and uh, all of the participation makes it all wonderful for us it's always a pleasure to do and deliver these things and i do look forward to the next one and i hope to see you all there until then that's all from me for now good night thank you everybody good afternoon good morning good evening or good night stay safe <laughs>